Homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Today we're looking at a bit of an overview of the four modes of practice and the four immeasurables. And this is really looking at unlocking the doors to Nibbana. So this is really linked to that first doorway to Nibbana that we looked at, the Dukkha Patipada Danda Binya, that we looked at on Poya. So the four modes of practice are really called the Patipadas in Pali and the immeasurables, which is where these insight pathways lead to, are the upper manangs. So let's begin. Let's begin with the Vitara Sutta in Ankutra Nikaya chapter 4, discourse number 162, and it tells us in detail what these four modes of practice on the profitable side are. The first one is Dukkha Patipada Danda Binya, which is painful practice with slow realization. And we did in fact look at this in the last Poya Dhamma session. And this is when someone is ordinarily full of acute greed, hate and delusion. They often feel the pain and sadness that greed, hate and delusion bring. The five spiritual faculties manifest in them weekly. So these are conviction, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. Because of this, they only slowly attain the conditions for the ending of defilements in the present life. The second one is Dukkha Patipada Kipa Binya, so painful practice with quick realization. Again, the person is ordinarily full of acute greed, hate and delusion. And the five faculties manifest in them strongly. So that's the distinction. And because of this, they swiftly attain the conditions for ending the defilements in the present life. So this is the painful practice with quick realization. Then we have the Sukha Patipada Danda Binya, so pleasant practice with slow realization. This is when someone is not ordinarily full of acute greed, hate and delusion. So they rarely feel pain and sadness that greed, hate and delusion bring. Their five faculties manifest in this case weekly and they only slowly attain the conditions for the ending of defilements in the present life. And so then the last one is Sukha Paripada Kipa Binya, so pleasant practice with quick realization. And so again, this person is not ordinarily full of acute greed, hate and delusion. They have the five spiritual faculties which manifest in them strongly. And so because of that, they attain the conditions for the ending of defilements in the present life uh, swiftly. So those are the four. We've already looked at one <clears throat> insight pathway for these uh, modes of practice, which is we've looked at Dukkha Patipata Danda Binya. And really, this is quite an important uh, aspect to the Buddha's teaching that isn't emphasized enough because they match with the four nutriments and going the four wrong ways. Instead, if you understand that as the Samudaya, the arising, then you also understand these four profitable modes of practice as a way of looking at the cessation, the niroda or the atangama, the passing away. So they match together, they, they can be paired off. So very important to understand what these are. The question that arises from looking at the four modes of practice is really, which is the best? And the Buddha did answer this in the Ubaya Sutta, which is in Anguttara Nikaya chapter four, discourse number 166. Now, what he says about the Dukkha Patipata Danda Binya, painful practice with slow realization, is he says it's inferior in both ways. One, because it's painful, the meditation objects are not pleasant, and because it's slow, so it's said to be inferior in both ways. With Dukkha Patipata Kipa Binya, painful practice with quick realization, it's also said to be inferior because it's painful. And then with Sukha Patipada Danda Binya, pleasant practice with slow realization, the Buddha says it's also inferior because it's slow. And then with pleasant practice with quick realization, so Sukha Patipada Kipa Binya, Buddha nominates this one to be superior in both ways because it's pleasant and because it's swift. Now the thing about these modes of practice is it's very easy for us as seekers to think, oh, okay, then I'll go for the pleasant practice with quick realization because it's superior in both ways. But the problem with that is that normally uh, it is someone like Venerable Sariputta who can undertake such a mode of practice and uh, undertake it with success. 
So we often uh, go towards something that is quite difficult before understanding that for all of us right now, given that it's the time 2000, almost 600 years after the Buddha, it's actually good for us to start by looking at each one by one and to slowly through the different things that we learn, the different inside pathways of the Buddha and the different Dhamma concepts and different Dhammas, that we slowly train ourselves because what's pretty clear about these modes of practice is that we really need to sharpen our spiritual faculties. So most of us might think that if we practice Dhamma for a long time, that our spiritual faculties are sharp. But the problem is that what happens is if we've been practicing the wrong things, they're actually still quite blunt. And so one has to be quite humble and quite I guess honest if you can, if you can see it, that most most of us, our spiritual faculties start out very, very weak, very, very blunt. And so when you try and apply yourself to the Buddhist teaching, there are impediments. And sometimes these impediments come from conceit, so things associated with the, the mental stains, or they are also because we haven't known how we sharpen our spiritual faculties, our indriyas. In the suttas, we do get a glimpse of Venerable Sariputta and Mahamogalana's modes of practice because they have a dialogue about this. And in the Mahamogalana Sutta, he says to Venerable Sariputta, Reverend Sariputta, I relied on the painful practice with quick realization to free my mind from defilements by not grasping. And then in the Sariputta Sutta, Venerable Sariputta says to Venerable Mahamogalana, Reverend Mogalana, I relied on the pleasant practice with swift insight to free my mind from defilements by not grasping. So as we can see, Venbo Mahamogalana, he used the Dukkha Patipada Kipa Binya. So he used the painful uh, path and his spiritual faculties were actually quite sharp. So he was able to actually realize through, I guess, Karuna Apamana, the uh, immeasurable compassion and when it comes to Venerable Sariputta, he actually realized through the superior path, which is the pleasant practice with swift insight. So Sukha Paripada, Kipa Binya. And of course, that is through Metta Apamana, as we'll see as we go through what these insight pathways are. So it's pretty clear that the noble disciples of the Buddha have used these modes of practice, so these doorways to Nibbana in order to free themselves for full liberation, awakening Nibbana. Now people will say, uh, is this something that lay people uh, can, can use or is it something simply for monastics? And the answer is it's for all of us. There is no distinction about what can and can't be used. It, when we get go through this, you'll see why, because the, the pathways lead to particular fruit and this fruit is available to all of us. Now, when it comes to the final pathway, which is the superior one that Venerable Sariputta went through, it's not so easy for a lay person to actually attain arahanship. In fact, a lot of things are going against us for that because we live the householder life. However, for a monastic, if you abide by the Buddha's Vinaya, you, you are true to what the Buddha has given us as the form for uh, ordaining as a monk or a nun, then it's easier because the conditions are easier. There's a level of renunciation and relinquishment that has already happened. And if one practices according to these modes of practice, then path and fruit should come relatively quickly. But it also is determined by the level of mental stains and the level that one is suvicha, obedient or easy to instruct in terms of what the Buddha says. So in terms of this from a lay perspective, there should be a lot of encouragement towards this because it can be very fruitful. I think that's the thing to say. These modes of practice, these uh, doorways to Nibbana can be very, very fruitful. And they're linked to the Satarahara, which is the four nutriments. And we know that we suffer when we crave the four nutriments. So if you've been following along, you can see this is pretty much the medicine that the Buddha gives for craving the four nutriments. And you can pair them off and see what is the specific medicine at each, each line of the inside pathway. So let's, let's continue.
We can now go to the Pithika Disclosure or Pithakupadesa and the final chapter gives us more detail about these four profitable directions. So we know that we begin with the four modes of practice, so the Patipada. That then means that we enter the jhanas, so the mental absorptions. And then we get to the Satipatthana, which is establishments of mindfulness. And then we get to the Vihara, which is the abidings. And then we need to make some effort, so there are the four right strivings, the Samapadana. And then we contemplate the four wonderful and marvellous ideas, Acharyang, Abhutadhammang. And because of that, we make four determinations, so these Aditana. And there are four kinds of concentration that are developed because of that, which is the Samadayo. And then we get to the four ideas conducive to happiness, Dhamma Sukha Bhagya. And this leads to the four immeasurable states, so the Appamana. So what's key about these uh, four profitable directions is that there's clear insight pathways that are being followed. And they are really the medicine that pairs off against the four nutriments and going the four wrong ways. So instead of uh, craving each of the four nutriments and going the four wrong ways due to desire, hate, fear and ignorance or delusion, sorry, then we cultivate these four modes of practice and you get to the immeasurable states, the four doorways to Nibbana. What is probably useful to do right now is to familiarize ourselves through the suttas with some of these Pali terms that we've referred to and look at their meanings to try and understand where the Buddha is coming from. So let's start to look at this similar to what we did with the four nutriments. We've already looked at the modes of practice up front. So now we can ask the question about what are the four mental absorptions, the jhanas. And the Buddha says, throughout the suttas, pretty much the same thing. But this I've taken from the Sekhapatipada Sutta. So this is the uh, trainee's mode of practice or mode of progress that we have been studying. And of course, we know that to be accomplished in conduct, one needs to be able to, at will, uh, and with no trouble, attain the four jhanas. So it complements. So what it says is, and how does a noble disciple, one who obtains at will without trouble or difficulty, the four mental absorptions that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding in the present life. Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a noble disciple enters upon and abides in the first absorption. With the stilling of thought and examination, one enters upon and abides in the second absorption. With the fading away as well of rapture, one enters upon and abides in the third absorption. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, one enters upon and abides in the fourth absorption, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. So what we'll see when we go through in more detail these uh, modes of practice is that if you develop your meditation objects well at the outset, then it becomes quite easy to actually enter each of the, the jhanas and to train one of the things that people misapprehend about the jhanas is that jhanas are something that you focus on, but really it's more about your meditation object and the instructions given by the Buddha. Jhanas are the resultant effect of contemplating correctly, particularly insight pathways. We now ask what are the four establishments of mindfulness, so the Satipatthana, and there's numerous explanations throughout the Buddha's teachings and this is one of them. This says, this is the one way path for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the passing away of pain and displeasure, for the achievement of the method, for the realization of Nibbana, that is the four establishments of mindfulness. What for? Here, one dwells contemplating body in the body, feelings in feelings, mind in mind, phenomena in phenomena, ardent, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed covetousness and sadness in regard to the world. So the interesting thing about these four establishments of mindfulness is the pairing with the perversions. When you establish mindfulness on the body, feelings, mind and dhamma, essentially what you're doing is you're overcoming the perversions of seeing uh, beauty in what is ugly or fair in the foul. You're overcoming seeing sukha instead of dukkha. You're overcoming seeing 
me and mine in something that is not me and mine, and you're overcoming seeing impermanence or permanence in what is impermanent. And so what's interesting about the Satipatthana is that is the objective in terms of medicine. Uh, you overcome the perversions, the corruptions in one's mind. Then we ask the question, what are the four abidings or vihara? And the Pethikopadesa lists them as heavenly abode, which is the Dibha vihara. Then we have the divine abode, which is the Brahma vihara. Then we have the noble abode, which is the Arya vihara. And then we have the imperturbable abode, which is the Anenja Vihara. So heavenly abode refers to the first four form jhanas. The divine abode refers to the four Brahma Viharas, so metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, so loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. The noble uh, abode is really about the noble attainments, and the imperturbable is really about the four formless jhanas. And so for more on the uh, first three, you can go to the Venagapura Sutta in Anguttara Nikaya chapter 3, discourse number 63. And the Buddha explains to a Brahmin these high seats that he gains at will without trouble or difficulty, uh, as opposed to what the Brahmin is asking about, which is luxurious and high seating, made of fine cloth and uh, very lavish and luxurious. And for the Anenja Vihara, the best sutta is really the Anenja Sapaya Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 106. Then we look at what are the four right striving, Samapadana. And so there's a number of suttas that are very helpful for this. One is the Padana Sutta in Anguttara Nikaya chapter 4, discourse number 13. And it says, because there are these four right strivings, what for? One. Here, a bhikkhu generates desire for the non-arising of unarisen, bad, unwholesome states. He makes an effort, arouses energy, applies his mind, and strives. Two, he generates desire for the abandoning of arisen, bad, unwholesome states. He makes an effort, arouses energy, applies his mind, and strives. Then third, he generates desire for the arising of unarisen, wholesome states. He makes an effort, arouses energy, applies his mind, and strives. And then the last one is... He generates desire for the persistence of arisen wholesome states, for their non-decline, increase, expansion, and fulfillment by development. He makes an effort, arouses energy, and applies his mind and strives. So essentially, the first two relate to unwholesome, bad states. And so you don't want them to arise when they haven't already arisen. And when they have arisen, you immediately want to abandon them. And so you make effort in that way. The last two are around wholesome, wholesome states. And so when they haven't arisen, you want to make them arise. That's the, the first one of that. And then the second one is really when you have attainments like path and fruit, when you have wholesome mind states, you want to protect them, guard them, make sure that they linger, make sure they expand and expand to fulfill their development. And so these are the four right strivings. You can see that they're extremely helpful and very, very active. We now ask, what are the four wonderful and marvelous ideas, Acharya and Buddha Dhamma? What's really obvious is that these are actually the Four Noble Truths. So there are many suttas about the Four Noble Truths, but the one that we're looking at here is the Patama Samana Brahmana Sutta, Sangyuta Nikaya, Chapter 46, Discourse Number 5. Now the thing to understand about the four wonderful and marvelous ideas, they're actually the medicine for overcoming the taints, the asavas. So when you think about the taint of sensual desire, the taint of becoming, the taint of views, and the taint of ignorance, then the Four Noble Truths are the medicine for that, which make, does make a lot of sense. So in this sutta, the Buddha says, because whatever ascetics or Brahmins in the past fully awakened to things as they really are, all fully awakened to the Four Noble Truths as they really are. Whatever ascetics or Brahmins in the future will fully awaken to beings as they really are, or will fully awaken to the Four Noble Truths as they really are. And then lastly, whatever ascetics or Brahmins at present have fully awakened to things as they really are, all have fully awakened to the Four Noble Truths as they really are. What for? The Noble Truth of Suffering, the Noble Truth of the Origin of Suffering, the Noble Truth of the Cessation of Suffering, and the Noble Truth of the Way Leading to the Cessation of Suffering. So when we actually uh, do the work 
to understand, to fully understand the First Noble Truth, then this really helps with uh, uh, overcoming the taint of sensual desire. When we seek to abandon tanha, which is associated with the Noble Truth of the origin of suffering, so the second Noble Truth, then we're really trying to overcome the taint of becoming. When we uh, seek to realize the cessation of suffering, then we are trying to overcome the taint of views. And then the last one being the Noble Eightfold Path. When we actually fully develop the Noble Eightfold Path, then we overcome the taint of ignorance. So this is, this is really wonderful medicine. And now we come to the question, what are the four determinations or aditana? And the best sutta for this is really the Dato Vibhanga Sutta, Majjhimanakaya number 140, because this goes into a little detail in this sutta about these four determinations. So what are they? It says, and with reference to what was this said about these four determinations, there are the determination for wisdom, so Panya Aditana, the determination for truth, which is Satcha Aditana, the determination for relinquishment, which is Chaga Aditana, and the determination for calm, which is Upasamadhi Aditana. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Bhikkhu, this person has four determinations. And then the Buddha goes on to say, one should not neglect wisdom, should preserve the truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for calm. So really this is what the, the path that we are leading, the Noble Eightfold Path, these are the determinations which underpin how we walk and develop the Noble Eightfold Path. Now what's interesting about these determinations are they are the medicine for the floods, so the augers that we looked at in the Four Nutriments. So you have the sensual desire flood or flood of sensual desire, you have the flood of, of coming to exist, you have the flood of views and you have the flood of ignorance. So when you actually cultivate these four determinations, that is what you are treating and trying to overcome with this medicine. We can now ask what are the four kinds of concentration, samadayo, and there are numerous places in the sutta, Pitika, that actually list out the four kinds of concentration that need to be developed. And it's really in the Idipada Sangyutta of Sangyutta Nikaya, which is very helpful. But the sutta that we're looking here is just a summary, which is from the Idipada Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, chapter 4, discourse number 276. So the four concentrations are the concentration due to desire, Chanda Samadhi, the concentration due to energy, which is Virya Samadhi, the concentration due to mind, which is Chitta Samadhi, and the concentration due to investigation, which is Vimangsa Samadhi. And as we know from briefly looking at the Noble Eightfold Path, how we develop it is linked to how we develop the Noble Eightfold Path. So the, all the different, the eight components of the Noble Eightfold Path fit directly with these concentrations. And so that's why it also comes after looking at uh, you know, the four, the four wonderful and marvellous ideas and the determinations. But what this actually treats as a medicine is really the darts or the barbs, so the sullas. And really this is when you look at the dart of sensual desire, the poison that you, you think that there is something fair in the foul, the concentration to desire, Chanda Samadhi, really helps to overcome that dart. In terms of the dart of uh, hate, then what this really does is really overcome that. So you do that with the chitta samadhi, the concentration due to mind. And when it comes to the dart of views, then the vidya samadhi is something that is the medicine for that. And when it comes to the dart of delusion, the mohasalla, then the medicine is this concentration due to investigation. So very, very potent medicine that we're using. Then we ask, what are the four ideas conducive to happiness? So Dhamma Sukha Bhagya. And a really good sutta is the Subrahma Sutta in Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 2, discourse number 17. And this is in relation to Subrahma, the God, who comes to the Buddha and asks him about the escape from fear. And uh, the, the God actually says in this sutta, this mind is always anxious, this mind is always stressed about stresses that haven't arisen and those that have. Is there a state free of anxiety? Please answer my question. And so the Buddha really answers that there's no escape from fear without letting go of everything. So what he says is this, this verse, 
not without understanding and mental austerity, not without restraining the sense faculties, not without relinquishment of all, do I see safety for living creatures. This is what the Buddha said. And then the God vanished after hearing the answer to that. But what we can see from that is it links up with what is said in the Pethakopadesa that really when Buddha talks about not with understanding, well, you need the enlightenment factors, the Bojangas, in order to complete that, to understand with wisdom, insight. Not, not other than mental austerity, that refers to the Ilipadas because it's a mental strength that one is, is drawing on and you get that from the basis of spiritual power, the Ilipadas. Then when the Buddha talks about uh, not without restraint of sense faculties, of course this is the Indriya Sangvara. And then when it comes to not without relinquishment of all, this is really the Sabba Nisagga. So this is very much to complete the entire path for full liberation. Now, what this is the medicine from or for is really where the steadying point for consciousness keeps going back to form, feeling, perception and mental volition, um, volitional formations. So when you know that, you know that these are the four ideas, the four dhammas that help you to actually overcome every time we know that consciousness keeps coming to rest somewhere, particularly with the swinging monkey, it keeps trying to establish itself. When it establishes itself, usually based on sankharas, like mental constructions, stories, then we end up with the same thing all over again. So when you use these four things, you really help to overcome that. So we finally get to the four immeasurable states, so the Apamana, and in the Sangiti Sutta, Digha Nikaya, Discourse number 33, the Buddha talks about a mendicant meditating, spreading with a mind filled with loving kindness in one direction, then the second, the third, and the fourth. And in the same way, upwards, downwards, and across, everywhere, always with a mind filled with metta to the whole world, abundant, expansive, limitless, free of hatred or will, ill will. And the same for... Uh, karuna apamana, so immeasurable compassion. So the first was immeasurable uh, loving kindness. And then the third, we have immeasurable sympathetic joy, so mudita apamana. And then fourthly, we have upeka apamana, again in the same way, which is the immeasurable equanimity. Now, this is really the medicine for going the wrong ways. So when we uh, crave the four nutriments, we go the wrong way uh, due to will. Or desire we go the wrong way due to hate we go the wrong way due to uh, fear and then we go the wrong way due to delusion and so when you get to these uh, final states as part of cultivating the four modes of practice you're really overcoming those things and so it's a very powerful thing it's not just simple uh, mundane loving kindness, mundane compassion, mundane joy, and mundane uh, equanimity. It's really you've cultivated the entire insight pathway in order to get to the right state of mind. You've overcome and abandoned certain things. You've realized certain truths. You've uh, developed um, the path correctly, and then you get to these these doorways to nibbana. Now that we've been through a bit of a process to understand, we can look at what we call Buddha's process map, insight pathways or knowledge pathways, because this is bringing it all together and looking at it in one table. And you can see that when you develop these four modes of practice, you learn how to unlock the doors to Nibbana. And these doors to Nibbana are not necessarily simple. Uh, in, in order to unlock, as we know. But at the same time, when one is suvicha, one, one has that ability to be easy to instruct, where you methodically, gradually start to learn these things, then what happens is slowly you chip away at understanding the gravity, the importance of what the Buddha is teaching and how they all link together. So that's the main thing about this. Don't be alarmed if you don't understand everything because these are high dhammas and there are a few things to understand when we look at this table that will alleviate some of the concern or some of the, the fear around learning these dhammas and I think uh, it's a real investment uh, when it comes to being able to know this, these truths and to know the way that the Buddha taught in order for us to ourselves open the doorways to Nibbana.
throughout this session, I've mentioned the pairing off, and it's actually explicitly said in the Pethakopadesa, Pitika Disclosure, it actually says, the pairing off is this, the four nutriments and the four modes of practice, four perversions and four establishments of mindfulness, four clingings and four mental absorptions, four bonds and abidings, body ties and right strivings, taints and wonderful and marvelous ideas, floods and determinations, darts and concentrations, steading points for consciousness and ideas conducive to happiness, four goings the wrong ways and four immeasurable states. This is the construing of the profitable and unprofitable by opposite. So what that is saying is that there's a matching of how we get sick. So when you know the samudaya, how we get sick, how that arises, there is perfect medicine for that unprofitable side by pairing it with the profitable side. And that's how it's done. And so at the end, what's really interesting about this, which all of us really need to take into our minds is its end is the four fruits and the idea demonstrated as the first profitable direction has for its end the fruit of stream entry, the second the fruit of once return, the third the fruit of non-return and the fourth the fruit of arahanship. So if you learn the unprofitable side, the four nutriments that helps you with the samudaya, it also helps you to see the danger the Ardhinava of everything. It also helps to see the gratification, the Asadha as well, when you look at the four nutriments. But when you look at these profitable directions, these modes of practice and how it gets to the immeasurables, these doorways to Nibbana, you actually see the escape. You see the, the Niroda, the cessation as well. So when you put them together, you see the five things that the Buddha wants you to see, which is the arising and passing away, or the arising and cessation. You see the gratification, which is the asadha. You see the uh, danger, which is the adhinava, and you see the nisarana, the escape. And so that's where we get to the fruit of these pathways. Stream entry, once return, non-return, and arahanship. What we have here now is a summary table of the four profitable directions. So you can see there are 10 parts to the insight pathways that work, that, uh, work downwards. Uh, the last poya, we went through the first profitable direction. So Dukkha Patipada, Danda Binya, painful practice with slow realization. And we cultivated immeasurable metta. And if you cultivate that very well, now we know that the fruit of this pathway is the fruit of stream entry, Sotapanna. If you know how to do the second profitable direction, so painful practice with quick realization, Dukkha Paripada Kipa Binya, and you follow the inside pathway that leads to the immeasurable karuna, immeasurable compassion, metta, karuna apamana, you get to the fruit of one's return, which is Sakadagami. And then if you know the third profitable direction, which is the, men, the medicine for mental volition as nutriment, which is Sukha Paripada Danda Binya, then you cultivate this inside pathway that leads to immeasurable joy, mudita apamana, you get to the fruit of non-return, anagami. And then if you cultivate the last path, then you cultivate sukha patipada, kipa binya, which is pleasant practice with quick realization. And you cultivate that inside pathway, the 10 steps, you get to immeasurable equanimity, upeka apamana, and you realize the fruit of arahanship. So Araha. So we're not going to go in detail into this table here. As we know from looking at the first profitable direction, it is quite involved. You need to know uh, certain dhammas. You need to know the meditation objects that you take in order to cultivate the path. But what I recommend is to familiarize yourself with this, match it with the four nutriments, and really start to feel more at ease. So the first real step is to become more at ease with these dhammas, that they don't become frightening. You start to learn what they are and you start to see why we need to know them. And really, these pathways, meditating on them, they're very powerful. They're also very powerful both for lay people and for monastics. For monastics, because the container involves more renunciation, letting go of householder life, it is somewhat easier to come quickly to these meditations. But for lay people, it's 
it's possible. There are many people who have cultivated these meditations with very good results. And if anything, the, the spiritual faculties have been sharpened and other parts of the, the path towards liberation have been developed. The final slide we can look at is something that was used during the last Poya session. And it was really to show how the Buddha's path comes together with the enlightenment factors. So the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas. Because when we look at what we are developing, we are developing things all together. They're connected. And so when you look at these four profitable directions, you can really see it. So when it comes to the five powers, the five powers, they're literally the same as the five spiritual faculties, except they're activating each other. There's a sutta that looks at how the five powers and the five spiritual faculties are linked. And really, what's really important is they're very supportive of the path because when you start to sharpen these faculties, they really help you to understand Dhamma. So if you go through this session or even the session on the four nutriments and you find, oh, I don't know what that is. This is difficult. Oh, it's too much. Really come to the understanding that one needs to develop some patience because when our spiritual faculties are weak, they're blunt. So it makes us difficult, it makes it difficult for us to actually penetrate Dhamma. And also when it's new, there's also this impediment because it's all new. But even when you've been in Dhamma a long time, what happens is if you haven't learned Dhamma correctly, you haven't followed Buddha's instructions, or you haven't been taught in a particular gradual sequential way, it's often difficult to pick it up quickly. So this is what the Buddha means when you have blunt faculties, blunt spiritual faculties. So there's certain things like uh, the Vatupama Sutta, Anumana Sutta, Saleka Sutta, when you're actually trying to uh, clean the mind, like purify the mind, because when you purify the mind, it's not blocked anymore. It's not blocked by stains, by defilements, and also by the hindrances. And when that happens, it means you, you're able to sharpen the faculties. So the more time you spend listening to the Buddha's words, that also helps. The more time you contemplate certain aspects of the Buddha's teaching, it also helps to sharpen uh, the faculties, particularly if you're meditating in the correct way. And also, of course, it always um, circles back. And so when you look at the four profitable directions, you see that you're, you're looking at the four establishments of mindfulness, Satipatthana. This is part of the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas. Also, the four right striving is there. So is the development of the Noble Eightfold Path is there because it's a key part of uh, developing the path, the entire path. Also, the basis of spiritual power we've touched upon a number of times in this session. And then also the seven enlightenment factors, the Bojangas. And so when you look at it in this way, the Four Noble Truths are also there. So when you look at it in this way, you see the completeness of the Buddha's teaching. You see the completeness. Nothing is left aside from how you cultivate towards liberation. And so the recommendation is not to worry or fret about not knowing different aspects to this. It's more, more about getting comfortable with it, getting familiar with it. And then when we talk Dhamma, it's easy to see how things fit. So it will take some time. For all of us, it takes time for the Dhamma to sink in. It takes time for our spiritual faculties to sharpen. It takes time for the path to, to grow. And so all the meditations that we learn through this channel, this Sutta Meditation Series channel, they all help you to eventually understand this Dhamma, understand the doorways to Nibbana. So it's an encouragement. It's good to know this. Uh, we probably won't go through the second, third, and fourth profitable direction too quickly. It's good to know even just the first profitable direction to begin with, because essentially you don't pick and choose this. You actually learn all of it, and you learn it in a way that is comfortable, easeful, and helps you to grow in Dhamma. So if you spend the rest of your life learning something, this is something like a very, very wise investment. Now, the other thing to say before we finish off is, the first profitable direction is always the aloba path, so non-greed path. So it's overcoming the loba, it's overcoming what we were looking at in uh, Kapalinkara Hara, the first nutriment, which is 
uh, physical nutriment. The second profitable direction is really associated with the non-hate path. So when we're looking at contact as nutriment, that is the, the hateful path. And so this, unpro this profitable direction, the second one is really about adosa, the non-hate path. And then the third and fourth together, right? So when we looked at mental volition as nutriment and we looked at consciousness as nutriment, we said that is about delusion. That's the delusion path. So the third and fourth profitable directions, so Sukha Paribhada Danda Binya, Sukha Paribhada Kipa Binya, so pleasant practices with slow and quick realization. This is really about the non-delusion path. So these final three uh, profitable directions, they actually, you need a little bit more time to work on the other aspects that we've been studying through the Sutta Meditation series before we get to looking at these second, third and fourth profitable directions. So let some of that Dhamma sink in and use the time to just familiarize yourself with these things. And so we'll eventually get there. We'll eventually get to also the Idipadas, how to develop them correctly, what is what are the meditations for those things, uh, being able to see how we develop the Satipatthana correctly, because not a lot of people and teachers align with the Buddha by seeing it as the medicine for the perversions, the vipalasas. If you don't see that and you don't see how you establish all four, you don't pick and choose that you establish just Dhamma Satipatthana, you actually need to know how to establish all four, then you're not establishing it correctly and you're not overcoming the perversions. So there's certain really wonderful dhammas that the Buddha is teaching us, and we'll, we'll get to all of it, but step by step, chipping away slowly, can't rush these things. So again, it's an encouragement. So whatever meditation you're focusing on now, keep at it, make it your vehicle, make it strong, uh, make the concentration of the mind something that is easy to get to, enjoy the meditation, brighten the mind, share the merit with all sentient beings, and uh, that's the way to go. So we can probably end the session here. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. May the doorways of Nibbana remain open to all sentient beings. Blessings of the Triple Gem, wishing you all well in your practice. Deruan Saranai.